Session 10, Tires and the Environment. Um, Denise Kennedy, president of DK Enterprises, is going to be our moderator, and I've already introduced her, so I'm going to turn it over to Denise. Everybody stay awake now, because we're going to have a technical afternoon, which is going to be really good. So uh, I, I think you're going to find them interesting. Um, where's Joaquin? Oh, here he comes. I'm going to, we decided to talk to a couple people. We're going to introduce them right now all one time so we can just sort of flow through the conversations as they occur and we'll ask questions at the very end. And uh, so this, this particular session is uh, had a relationship myself with working with uh, testing for 6PPD and uh, Q and, and so I just think this is the time to have a panel like this and then we have our, I'm actually going to start with Joaquin down at the end because he's been so involved and everybody kind of knows him. He's the backbone of uh, a lot of what we do in our industry, and he knows all, he's going to present on the uh, zinc study today that's happened with Humboldt County. And if you ever have questions, political, testing, or otherwise, I also say go to Joaquin. He's pretty good. No, Thank that's because he's here local and he's contracted with Cal Recycle. So, Joaquin. Joaquin is a senior technical director, sustainable resource engineer, and a tire derived aggregate specialist for GHD. He obtained his BS in environmental resource engineering from Humboldt State University. He is a cred credential, he is a credentialed sustainability professional and has extensive experience in landfill design, environmental remediation and recycled material evaluations for use in civil engineering applications. He also works with Stacey Patna, who is right back there, who does all of our TDA projects through Cal Recycle. <clears throat> His experience includes outreach, education, and product development with end-of-life tires, waste carpet, and mattress components. For over 20 years, Joaquin has developed and managed material evaluations, research projects, and pilot studies and outreach efforts for cow recycle programs. Okay, that's Joaquin. Now I'm going to go to, um, we have our, 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 one of our presenters. There's two of them together. And he's not on the call yet. He is. He is? Yeah. is he going to be visible to us? Do you know? Okay, hopefully. Tommy is going to work on that, I hope. Uh, so, uh, Ellie Hodge is a director of Western Regional Super Paved Center and professor of civil engineering from the University of Nevada. Uh, he is the also uh, Western, he's the associate director of the Western Regional <laughs> Super Pave. I just said that, sorry. I better get my glasses on because all of a sudden I can't read everything. <laughs> all right. Sorry about this. All right. So Dr. Uh, Hodge authorized over 100 publications in journals, national and international conferences, and technical reports. He served as the principal investigator on multiple projects for FHWA, FAA, and state DOTs, local governments, and private industry. He's a member of the Association of Asphalt Paving Technology, Technologists, uh, Academy of Pavement, Science and Engineering, and a whole bunch more. And he said to cut it short, because he's got a lot on his. Uh, the other person that you can't, oh, there he is. Dr. Yang, also known as Frank. Are you, you can hear us and everything? Okay, great. All right, now he's also with Associate Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Nevada, Reno. His research expertise and interests have been focused on the environmental chemistry of organic carbon and emerging contaminants in natural and engineering systems. Funded by NSF, DOE, Department of Agriculture and Industrial Partners, his research has led to over 80 peer-reviewed publications and one book, John Wiley and Sons by John Wiley and Sons Publisher. He has served as an associate editor or equivalent roles for seven journalists and has been recognized by Alexander Von Humboldt Research Fellowship, U.S. National Academy of Engineering, and again, a whole bunch more things. So I'm going to kind of cut it shorter. Then my next person, Andrew. Andrew I've worked with, uh, and uh, I'm going to say this because he can't tell you this, but I can. We have worked with Andrew at... Uh, Eurofins Environment Testing America through my feedstock conversion. We did quite a bit of testing when 6PPD came up as an issue. And uh, so that's how I met Andrew. Count on him a lot for those kinds of things. And they did other testing. 
Andrew is the Corporate Technical Director for Eurofence Environment Testing America for the Specialty Services Division. He brings over 20 years of experience in the environmental laboratory industry with a focus on, and I don't know what these things are, HRGC slash HRMS analysis and also an LSMS MS analysis. These approaches have focused on PCBs, dioxins, brominated flame retardants, PFAs, emerging contaminants, and human biomonitoring. He has, uh, among a lot of handful of European scientists, focused on advanced analytical techniques such as non-target analysis and a whole bunch more initials. And, I'm, and he's, right now, Eurofins is in West Sacramento, so I'm going to cut yours short, too. <laughs> and then, now we're going to get to Anne. I've got to find yours on here. I know you're here. Okay, Anne. So Ann cooper Darty is a PhD senior environmental scientist who heads up the Safer Consumer Products Program, California Department of Toxic Substance Control. Ann Cooper leads, Dougherty, leads the chemical and product evaluation unit within the Safer Consumer Products Program at the California Department of Toxic Substances. She has served as a team leader for SCP's work on zinc and 6PPD in motor vehicle tires and one comma, four dioxin, okay, and personal care and cleaning products. She has also participated in other projects, including uh, non-phenyl, I'm probably not saying these words right, I'm not going to say it, it's a ex ethosylates, see I'm not the technical one here, and laundry detergents and the development of SCP stakeholder information management website, CalSAFER. Ann Cooper received a PhD in environmental chemistry from Stony Brook University, where she studied the occurrence, fate, and transport of quaternary ammonium compounds in esterine environments. Close enough? <laughs> okay, I tried. I probably butchered those two pieces. So. so anyway, I really am excited about this group because it's been a hot topic since uh, the fall of 2020, I think. And they're all going to talk about it a little bit in different contexts. And uh, looking forward to this one. So thank you. OK. So we're going to start off with Ann. All right. Thanks so much for having me. As Denise said, I'm Ann Cooper Doherty. I'm chief of the now just the chemical evaluation unit. We've been undergoing some reorganization, so things have shifted a little bit in the last few months. But anyway, I'm glad to be here to talk with you today. First talk after lunch. Hopefully, you will keep it peppy. Um, so I'm going to go over our program, kind of what it is that we do and how it works, because it's very different from a lot of other regulatory programs that are out there. I'll tell you the work that we're doing related to tires and then do a little bit about our work specifically on 6PPD and 6PPD quinone. So the Safer Consumer Products Program at DTSE, essentially we regulate chemicals in consumer products. So we do that through what we call a four-step process. It's a little bit fuzzy on exactly if it's a four-step process, um, but I'll go over each of these steps kind of at a high level and then we'll go into them in a little more detail. So the first step is our candidate chemical list, CC list as we call it, and that is the menu of chemicals that we can choose from to potentially regulate. So from there, we look at those chemicals in the context of products, consumer products, and we prioritize them based on their potential to cause harm. Once that we prioritize to the top, we go through the official rulemaking process and they become what we call priority products. Once they officially get listed as um, priority products through the rulemaking process, we then go to our third step, and that's where typically manufacturers, they have a number of means of compliance, but the chief one really is to conduct an alternatives analysis, um, where they're evaluating alternatives to the chemicals that we've highlighted that are of concern. Once they submit that report to us, we list it for public comment, we evaluate it, and then we have our fourth step, which is our regulatory response, and that's where there's a number of different um, regulatory actions that we can take in response to the AA report that we get from the manufacturers. And then the green purple blob uh, to the right is compliance and enforcement um, that really can start, you know, the minute the rulemaking is finished to list a priority product and kind of extend um, throughout the end of the process. So a little bit more in detail um, on each of the steps. Our candidate chemical list, our CC list, as I said, is the menu of chemicals that we can choose from. 
it's we've taken 23 different authoritative lists that other authoritative bodies have put together, like a WeHouse Prop 65 or some waterboard list or European list, put them all together into one big list called our candidate chemical list. And 6PPD, which we've been talking about and talk a little bit about more, is on that list. Um, and so that meant that it's something that we could um, potentially regulate. So moving on to the second step, um, the world of consumer products is vast. Um, it's overwhelming at times. Um, so there are a few things that we are excluded from, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, radioactive chemicals, natural toxins, things like that. But otherwise, the world is pretty wide open. Um, so to narrow that down, both for ourselves as well as industry, we produce what we call a priority product work plan um, every three years. And that forms essentially the menu of products that we are going to be considering over that three-year time frame. The one exception to that is if we get a petition from an outside um, group, then we can look at a chemical, I mean, a product that's not on our work plan. But otherwise, we have to stick to the work plan. So our current work plan, six different groups on there now. Um, building products and materials used in construction and renovation is one of our newer ones. That's mainly focused on evaluation of artificial turf. Beauty, personal care, and cleaning products, I mean, beauty, personal care, and hygiene products, and cleaning products are two really huge categories. They have been on our work plan ever since we were started in 2013, and those are work, that's work that we continue to do. Food packaging is also a somewhat recent addiction, um, addition, as well as children's products. And then the one of most of interest here is, of course, the motor vehicle tires. Um, that was added to the work plan in part because of the petition that we received um, by the California Stormwater Quality Association to look at zinc in motor vehicle tires. We were already working on that. And then um, this work plan came out right after the 6PPD, 6PPD quinone story came out. So because of both of those, we added motor vehicle tires to our work plan. So that means that we could potentially regulate them at this point. So the second step where we're um, kind of prioritizing product chemical combinations, <clears throat> what we're really doing is we're looking at all those chemicals on the CC list and evaluating them in the context of products. And this is where we started to get a little different from a lot of other regulatory agencies. Here we're looking for potential. We're looking for potential for exposure to the chemical from the product and potential for that exposure to cause or contribute to significant or widespread harm. So we don't have to do water quality criteria or a numeric threshold or anything like that. We use what we call a narrative standard, so we kind of tell the story, if you will, of why we think there's potential for exposure, potential for harm. And the reason for some of that flexibility is because we're not instituting a ban we are requiring notification, as we'll talk about, and the condu um, conducting an alternatives analysis. So that's why our bar for moving forward in our regulatory process is lower than a lot of other regulatory approaches out there. So the overall process for listing a priority product, we research, we prioritize product chemical combinations. We do a ton of stakeholder engagement. For example, I have learned so much more about tires over the last few years than I probably ever thought that I would. I mean, that's because a lot is because of the engagement that we've had with our stakeholders. Um, we, like I said, go through the official rulemaking process, and then it becomes a priority product. So those um, two boxes on the slide are the list of adopted and proposed priority products um, that were, have officially announced. And then, of course, we've got a lot of other work evaluating ones coming up. We also have our SCP timeline. So this is on our website. It's updated quarterly. And it provides an update on our best guess of the timing for the projects that we're working on. So it can be a good place to go and kind of see the whole portfolio of things that we're working on. So once it's listed as an official priority product, we move on to that third stage. And this is where the focus moves from us to the manufacturers, who are then responsible for um, searching for and evaluating alternatives in their products is one of their compliance options. There's another, there's other options, but the alternatives analysis is the, the main one. So the alternatives analysis process as a whole, what we're trying to do is to avoid regrettable substitutions. There's been a history in the past of there's something that people are concerned about. They switch really quickly to another chemistry. It's just as toxic or potentially even more toxic, and then you kind of back to the same problem of having a toxic chemical in your product. So the AA process is hoping to kind of stop and make sure we're really thinking through the considerations before adopting an alternative. So part of the AA process is to answer a number of key questions. To start with, is the chemical in the product necessary? If so, is there a safer alternative? 
and you know, a really important one is, you know, what are the trade-offs in adopting whatever alternative that you might be uh, considering? We do have an alternative analysis guide that we have out there to help responsible entities as they move through the process, and we are actually in the process of updating that as well. And the AA is a pretty extensive process. Um, it requires evaluation of a lot of things, including ecological impacts, life cycle impacts, economic analysis. Performance evaluation is, of course, critical. We're never going to you know, push people to do something that would compromise the safety um, or the function of their, of their product. And then we put the AA out for public comment as well. And so if you may or may not have heard of the alternatives assessment, and that is um, what people have, have frequently done, and our alternatives analysis process is kind of an expansion of the existing alternatives assessment process. So the AA process is quite long. It's broken into two stages. The first stage is called the preliminary alternatives analysis. And in that report, um, they are, your, the manufacturers are kind of screening whatever alternatives are out there to prioritize ones that they think are most likely to be you know, contenders for an eventual um, alternative. So that one is due six months after, after the um, priority product is officially listed in regulation. So after they submit that, we evaluate it and um, hopefully approve it. It then goes for the second part of the AA, and that's where they take the alternatives that they've screened in in the first part and do a much more extensive evaluation and hopefully come up with something that will work. So in terms of considering alternatives, <clears throat> you know, people often think about just a chemical replacement and product reformulation, so drop something in or you know, kind of slowly change the pro product um, and go with that. But other options do include reducing the exposure potential. You could either reduce the amount of the chemical that's used in the product or you could reduce the amount of the chemical that's coming out of the product and, and available for exposure. Um, so it can, you know, th that can be a consideration as well. Um, you could even consider a vastly different product that does the same thing. So like instead of a paper receipt, you could do a receipt electronically. That often isn't as palatable because it would <laughs> require completely redoing your business. Um, but it is theoretically one of the alternatives that could be considered. So once the AA is submitted, um, we move on to the last step, which is the regulatory response. So regulatory responses are customized to, for each responsible entity, depending on the alternatives analysis report that they submit to us. So we put out a draft report, we have a public comment period, and then um, based on that, we finalize a regulatory response. So the options here are varied. Um, they can include nothing. We can say, looks good you know, keep on keeping on, no reg response. We can require additional information to us, additional information to consumers, um, additional safety measures. There is the option for sales restrictions and prohibitions, um, end of life product stewardship, and research funding. So those are the ones, the menu of, re of regulatory responses that we could potentially um, put forth. I will say um, there is an option with the AA process where if during the first part, you think there's just absolutely no alternatives, you can submit what we call an abridged AA in place of that first stage AA, that preliminary AA. Um, <clears throat> if you do that, you move quickly to the regulatory response phase. And for that one, there are two required regulatory responses that automatically go into place if you submit an abridged AA. Mm -hmm. And that's um, additional information to consumers and the research funding. So hopefully we enjoyed that <laughs> regulations 101 there. Um, so now we'll move on to the work that we are doing on tires. So um, first off, I'll mention the priority product. So we have proposed priority product of motor vehicle tires containing 6PPD. This is the effort that's furthest along. Rulemaking has begun. This summer we officially noticed that rulemaking and began that rulemaking effort. Um, the comment period has closed on that. We're considering comments finalizing the documents, and we currently anticipate an effective date of July 1st, 2023, and that would put the first stage of the AA due um, at the end of the year. We have a second priority, priority product that we have proposed, and that is motor vehicle tires containing zinc. Um, that one we are beginning the external scientific peer review process that we have to do before we start a regulation, um, and we antici anticipate initiating rulemaking in the first half of 2023, so it'll be about a year behind 6PPD. 
We've also got efforts kind of further up the pipeline. So we're doing screening projects um, for artificial turf, evaluating chemicals there that might be of concern. The key focus on that one has been PFAS, but we're also looking at what else might be out there. Um, we're also looking at other tire-related chemicals that might be of concern that popped up in the literature, and that's kind of an ongoing monitoring that we're, we're doing. And then we're also considering adding to our CC list. This is something that we are able to do through rulemaking. And we're considering adding, adding microplastics, which might sound a little weird because microplastics aren't traditionally thought of as a chemical, but our definition of chemical is very broad and actually would classify microplastics as a chemical. So we're considering adding that to our CC list, which means it could potentially be incorporated into a priority product if it were added. So just a quick case study on what it looks like to make the case for a priority product using this potential kind of bar. <clears throat> and this is on 6PPD. So 6PPD is an anti derogant for ozone and oxygen, as you all may know, but primarily ozone is the focus. It prevents the cracking of rubber. As you can see in the picture, although it might be a little blurry, the one on the right does not have an anti degradant The one on the left does. Obviously, it's an important function um, to make sure that the tires are not cracking. So what was discovered in the end of 2020 by researchers in Washington is that 6-PPD reacts with ozone to form a chemical called 6-PPD quinone. It turns out 6-PPD quinone is acutely toxic to coho salmon, and they are the most sensitive species that we found so far. Um, they're also toxic to rainbow trout and brook trout, and they've been, it's been linked to a lot of the salmon die-offs that have been occurring, particularly in Washington and the Pacific Northwest. So this came out in the end of 2020. We were able to move pretty quickly on this because of our lower bar, if you will, for um, showing potential. So the case that we made for potential for exposure to 6-PPD and 6-PPD quinone was that we know 6-PPD is used in presumably all tires. There are high rates of release of tire wear particles containing 6-PPD and potentially 6-PPD quinone to the aquatic environment. There is concern about end-of-life applications that may further contribute to this exposure. There's a lot of unknowns there. I think Dr. Hodge is going to present on some of the data, but um, a lot of unknowns, but there's the potential for that exposure to be there. And then also, there are detections of 6-PPD quinone in California runoff and waterways. And then on the potential for significant adverse impacts, we know that 6-PPD, which is the actual ingredient, is toxic at multiple trophic levels. 6-PPD quinone is acutely toxic to coho which is an endangered species in California. We have special um, call-outs to consider those impacts to endangered species in our regulations. And we know that this toxicity occurs at a variety of life stages. The environmental detections of 6-PPD quinone that have occurred in California, are some of them are above the LC50, which is the concentration that kills half of the salmon um, that are exposed. And there's also concern about impacts to California's Native American tribes. Um, because of the loss of the coho salmon, for which there's obviously a very strong cultural tie. So that's the case that we've made for moving forward and proposing motor vehicle tires containing 6-PPD as a priority product, and that's just an example of kind of the type of case that we tend to make when we propose priority products. So with that, I'll ask questions. I don't know if you... No, well, let's do them, if, I think, at the end. Okay, that's fine. Uh, some of them might cover your questions, uh, but ask, since you're there, how many have ever heard about, how many of you have heard about 6-PPD quinone? Okay, so most of the room, I was hoping that it's out there, so, okay, good. All right. Cool. So, Andrew Patterson is going to be next from Eurofence Testing. Good afternoon. Everyone's full of carbs, <laughs> as am I. Now we can hopefully stay awake. Um, well, let's see here. Uh, my name is Andrew Patterson. I'm the technical director for specialty services for Eurofins in uh, the U.S., but my home base is here in Sacramento. We have a pretty big lab. Uh, it's kind of like a lab mall uh, over in West Sacramento. Uh, we do things like microplastics. We just built a microplastic lab. We uh, study and look at uh, PFAS. We're doing wastewater uh, monitoring for SARS-CoV-2. Lots of di legacy contaminants like PCBs, dioxins, everything else like that. Um, shameless self-promotion. Eurofins is all over the place. Um, I spend most of my time here in Sacramento, but uh, we also have PFAS labs uh, in Knoxville and back in Lancaster, PA. 
Um, we do all sorts of things. In fact, I don't even know everything we do. Um, but it's it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool company to work for because um, we're our motto is testing for life. And so literally, if I have a project that I want to do that's going to benefit either the environment or the humans in that environment, I get to do it. Um, a little bit more about us. We again we do uh, traditionally. Um, tr traditional contaminants um, and also emerging contaminants, which is where this fits in. Um, this particular one, uh, 6BBD quinone, it was really exciting for me to work on because I was asked at a really high level. Um, somebody read the paper that came out in science uh, from University of Washington and Washington State and a lot of other organizations actually that don't get credit worked on that paper. Um, and they did, they did some really great work here and they knew it had to be bulletproof. Um, so I pulled this graphic from NOAA because I thought it, it really illustrated how they did this. They, they took fractions of this tire leachate and they narrowed down what was calling, causing those coho to die. Um, and, and I think this is really illustrative of, of what a unique problem this is because, you know, I've talked about, you know, I work on dioxins, I have to work on PCBs, I work on PFAS. Well, there's eight or 10,000 different PFAS, but in this case, through the work at UW, they actually isolated down this down to one compound. And that's really rare um, in this industry. It's really rare to, to, to have the, the toxic compound not be a whole class of compounds, but in fact, isolating it down just to, you can see, if we can read that down there, it gives the actual, the actual structure of it. This was, this was in December 2020, when the world was shut down. Um, this had actually, almost accidentally been discovered a couple years prior to it, but they, they, that other team didn't, didn't take it as far as, as UW did. Um, so again, this, this caused um, a lot of fanfare, and we actually started working on it that following week. Um, we're, we were stuck in quarantine. It was, it was a great thing to, to, pass, to pass the time to, to figure out. We took the, li the literature work, and we said, OK, how are we going to support the industry? Because really, you know, I, at the end of the day, I work for an analytical laboratory. We, we don't have agendas. Our job is to make sure that we can measure and quantify and deliver those results to you, everybody in this room, uh, with confidence and stand by you, no matter if it's talking about that data in court or submitted to the government or otherwise. So um, this was in, really an honor to, to be able to work on this. and as a consumer and angler of salmon, it was also near and dear to my heart. Um, I should mention first though, um, that 6-PBD is not 6-PBD quinone. Um, the compound that is added to tires to achieve the federal safety standards is 6-PPD. It is designed to react with ozone and it does so very efficiently to form, among other things, 6-PBD quinone. So 6-PPD quinone isn't ever added to a tire. It's the product of degradation from, from ozone and, or from oxygen and specifically from ozone. So um, things don't usually move this fast in the environmental world. Um, but this, when this paper hit, it hit the headlines. Um, that's the, the article there that came out in Science. Um, up, there was a big outcry up in Canada. As you can imagine, they have, they have a lot of salmon as well. Um, but I, you know, draw your attention down here to the fact that this went from publication to the floor of Congress in less than a year. That's pretty wild. That moves pretty fast. Um, people ask me all the time, is this going anywhere? Should I, what should I do about this? Um, we've invested significantly in it, and we know that we have competitors that are also looking to support this. Uh, we've seen a big recent uptick um, in requests for 6-PPD quinone analysis at, at this time of year. And that's because, you know, we just thankfully had some rainfall. Uh, and this, a lot of these studies are focused on stormwater. And in fact, when we brought up our method, uh, we were doing everything we could. You'll see a little bit later on. We didn't have any rainfall, but we wanted rainfall. Um, but this, I can, I can say for certainty that it uh, doesn't look like this is going anywhere anytime soon. Um, one thing that really opened up sort of the, the scope uh, for 6-PBD quinone was that as we learn more about 6-PBD quinone, uh, the toxicity isn't just isolated to coho. Um, the paper that came out uh, talking about the toxicity to rainbow trout really did make it a national issue and, and perhaps a global issue. 
I have colleagues down in Australia, and they brought up a method that's based on our method, or is our method, um, <coughs> because there, there's interest there. We've gotten samples as far away as the South Pacific. We had samples from the East Coast. We have samples from Europe. People are just poking around. This issue is really poorly delineated at this point. And so that study that came out talking about rainbow trout, everything just got really real because everybody's got rainbow trout. Um, so why do tires have these compounds? Again, we're a lab. We're just here to measure. Um, the compounds are anti-ozonants, and they, they have to be added to achieve these federal safety standards. Um, 6-PPD is just one of these, one of the family of compounds that are added. Um, but again, the, this compound isn't in tires uh, to cause toxicity. It's in tires to achieve federal safety standards and to be able to meet these requirements. Um, We've been asked to test some pretty odd things. Um, and as, as the method grows and we learn more and more, we're getting more efficient at some of these processes. But there's a laundry list of different things that we were, that we were asked to test. Um, one, one test that, that is gaining some traction is, is a wipe test, where we can just uh, take some uh, pre-cleaned gauze um, that are wetted down with some solvent, <coughs> wipe a known surface area. Then you submit those to the lab. We can say if there is 6-PVD quinone um, per area um, on, that, on, that, on that whatever you're testing. Um, so again, if you, if you have questions after this, you want to know kind of a little more detail, um, I'm, I'm happy to talk. I'm, I hope it comes across that I'm pretty passionate about this. Um, so how do we do this? So there, there's not going to be a chemistry test. There's not going to be, you know, too many structures or anything thrown out, but when we take a glass of water or a wipe test or something, what do we actually do? So when you, we throw out that term earlier that, that Denise was talking about, LCMS, that's, that really is, stands for liquid chromatograph mass spectrometer. And there are a lot of flavors, a lot of different designs that can be in your LCMS, but at the heart of it, your, your LC, your liquid chromatograph, separates compounds so that you don't have to look for the, the glut of them all at once. And your mass spectrometer is a mass filter that, that looks at specific masses on specific times. Um, LC-MS, MS, gives us a little bit more specificity and sensitivity uh, because we're actually taking the molecule, filtering it a first time, breaking it apart into pieces. Um, those fragments are then filtered again where we can detect them. So that's kind of like the general 10,000 foot view um, of what we're doing in the lab. There's another technique where we actually use to bring up this method, uh, which is called time of flight mass spectrometry. Um, that actually, the best way to think about that is we can, f we can bring a compound in, we can choose to break it apart or not, and then we're actually using probably one of the world's best stopwatches to then shoot that compound on a known flight path and detect it with precision to determine its exact mass. And when we use that approach, we don't need analytical standards to compare to. We can compare to libraries. Um, did I skip one? This thing's got a mind of its own. So, so in the analytical laboratory, we need isotopes. So no matter what we're looking for, if it's, if it's toxic or not, uh, if it's no matter what it is, uh, we need isotopes, and what do I mean by that? So we take the actual, we have the actual compound in question that we're looking for, and we're either using a deuterium ion, which is heavier than hydrogen and can be distinguished from hydrogen, or carbon-13. These are stable radio isotopes. Um, when, and where I'm, where I'm going with this is that we actually, these are our golden ticket. This is our golden ticket to be able to quantify your 6-PPD in your sample because we know how much of this compound that we add into that, and we're gonna go into that a little bit. But um, when we first started out, not only did we not have um, some of these isotopes, we didn't have any native compound. We, this compound did not, in, in, in all the internet and the, everything else like that, there was not any 6-PPD quinone. There was 6-PPD, and so we had a crack at making our own 6-PPD quinone, um, but ended up uh, getting a little bit from some some research partners, but th this where I'm what I'm trying to illustrate is that you know for as advanced as we think we are, when an emerging contaminant hits, 
we don't even have a way to measure it. So the work that they did up at University of Washington was pretty amazing because they did synthesize their own 6-PPD quinone. Um, now we've got options, and options give us some power. Um, so if you were to send in a sample, and again, this I'm giving an ex uh, example of, of a roadway runoff of storm water, but this, this could be literally anything. Um, you're just going to collect that water. You don't have to filter it. We're collecting it in amber glass bottles now. It was polypropylene bottles, but we've, we've switched to glass. Um, you put that back in a cooler with some ice. It shows back up in Sacramento the next day. We log it in, and what do we do? The, well, the first step, I guess I don't have a laser. The first step is we add that isotope that we talked about. We add that isotope um, to either, the, to either uh, a weighed out portion of that solid or to the aqueous sample itself. Uh, if it's a solid, uh, we sonicate with a series of solvents uh, to extract that 6 PVD quinone from those solids. And then we run onto that bottom step there, um, there, uh, which is the solid phase extraction, or SPE. And what that does is it allows a lot of the other interferences and the, the bulk of the water to go through while it's retaining the compound of interest. And then we analyze it on our instrument. That's a, a QTOF right there. And if everything turns out, you get a nice chromatograph like on the right there, which is our isotope that's on the bottom there. And then we have two different ions of our native compound. Um, so you can see that when we add that isotope in, even if that compound, if the 6-PVD was not there, we would know that our test is successful. So and then once we get the area of those different compounds, we don't have a problem quantitating. Um, our reporting limit is down to two parts per trillion for aqueous samples. That's nanograms per liter. And the reason that might sound really low, we're at two PPT, but um, as Dr. Doherty was showing that one graphic, the LC50, the concentration which half of the test subjects will die, is at 100 ppt. So, you know, we don't want to be just under that. We want to be safely under that. So now we've um, we've tested your sample. We've quantified those results. Um, again, this is just a general workflow. Uh, if you were to send in samples, we spike them, we SP extract them, we analyze them. Um, no matter what sample we're looking at, whether it's 6 ppd quinone or if it's um, PFAS or anything else like that. All of the peaks are reviewed by multiple live humans. We don't use computers or algorithms to de determine positives or non-detects. Um, and then finally, the results are digitally uploaded to the client. Um, so real world examples. So how, you know, we went from not having a method to developing a method, and now we, we're promoting that method. Um, again. Um, first brought this up in uh, 2020, and we didn't have any rain. It was a really, really dry period here in Sacramento, and so uh, without rain, we thought, well, where, do we, where are we going to get some rain? So we thought, car washes, automatic car washes. Those rain every day, no matter what. I personally am a fan of them. Um, that's why I put that purple foam stuff. Everyone loves that tricolor foam stuff, um, my kids included. So went through the car wash. Um, after the car wash was done, ran back in with some containers, um, collected those, those two containers there you can see. Um, it was quite a dynamic sample collection process and we had to go pretty quickly. Um, but then we ran them through our process and lo and behold, we found 6-PPD quinone. So this, this tested a couple things. One, the robustness of our method um, and also, you know, where, this, where are we going to get positive detections? Um, so we, you know, what are those, how do those detections fit in? Um, this is actually an older graphic from the original publication showing that the LC50 was between 0.8 and 1.5 micrograms per liter. Um, you can see that we're, we're right in that range um, with, with, our, with our car wash there. Um, but again, a lot of varying levels, but at the end of the day, we just wanted to say, like, you know, could we, could we detect this and are we getting good recovery of our isotope? Meaning, you know, is our method catching what it's supposed to catch um, and, and omitting what it's supposed to omit? So like a good scientist, um, we decided to repeat it because the question came up, well, well, are those car, is it just on the bottom of the car wash because there are so many tires there? Or is it actually getting pumped through the car wash system? And I'm not, I'm not meaning to pick on car washes. This was, if it had rained, I would have picked rain instead. Um, so pretty fancy sampling apparatus there. Uh, taped some bottles onto the bumper of my truck. 
um, opened them up, drove through the car wash, uh, and then homo uh, composited the bottles afterwards. Um, you can see that was you know full of surfactants and soap and everything else like that. But you know, indeed, we 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 were getting detections of 6-PBD quinone um, coming right detections of 6-PBD quinone coming coming right out of the sprayers. And so, you know, it's it, it maybe isn't just tires. Did this come from tires? Probably, but it could be coming from a couple other things, as as we'll see in some slides. But this this was interesting because even during dry conditions here in the valley, uh, you go through a car wash. You know, you're you're coating your car with 6-PBD quinone. And the next time it rains, it's maybe going to come off of there. Andrew, we have, like, can you close it in one minute? I think I can close it in one minute. Okay. Um, that was pretty quick. Um, here we go. It's not just tires. Uh, we actually tested some windshield wipers. Uh, there was a couple old trucks in the back of the lab. We extracted some windshield wipers, and lo and behold, on the older windshield wiper rubber, we actually did a wipe test on the rubber, we found uh, pretty significant amounts um, 375 nanograms per gram, or parts per billion, um, on, the, on the windshield wipers. The new wiper, you can see, had some down at 14 nanograms per gram. So it's not just tires. Now I realize that the rubber on a windshield wiper is a lot smaller than just you know, a single tire. But the point is, it could be in other consumer products. And we don't know what all those are yet. I'm going to skip past the American River part. It's near and dear to my heart as well. Uh, but we don't quite have enough time here. Um, Again, 6-PPD quinone. Um, the quinone is one of the one of the, the products of 6-PPD, but as you can see from this graph, there are other products. It just happens to be the one that we know is toxic to salmon and is decently stable in the environment. People always ask me, why aren't we looking for the parent compound, 6-PPD? Um, we can put the 6-PPD by itself in methanol in the dark, and it'll go down by about 50% in five days. So if your standard are degrading, there's no way you can uh, stand by that data and look at it. Mm -hmm. What have we learned? There's a lot of interest in the topic. 6-PVD uh, quinone is not limited to tires. The parent compound is designed to be N is very reactive. Um, it likes to stick to everything. That was part of the method development. Um, roads and runoff don't equal detections. We had to skip by that part. Um, but uh, we're here uh, to be able to, do, to support uh, the testing market. Our method is going to go undergo some refinement as we go, but we could deliver two PPT for aqueous samples, uh, 0.25 PPB for solid samples, and we're using top of the line instrumentation um, to get it done. What comes next? We don't know. Thank you, Andrew. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> no worries. We just, we just have a lot of presenters, and now we're going to have two together. Come on up. He's going to push the slides. We have Frank, as you already saw earlier, and he's going to move the slides for him. He's going to do the first five, I believe. Slide with this. I, I use this myself. Okay. Right. And just push that every time. And you want a picture? Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me here. So we're going to co-present myself and my colleague, uh, Frank, who is uh, right now in Europe. So it's uh, late night, if not early morning over there. But uh, I'm going to switch gear a little bit once we have the slides up uh, on, the, uh, on the big screen. But we're going to start talking more about asphalt pavement. So, um, oh, I have to. All right, there you go. So uh, basically, crumb rubber is used extensively, right, in asphalt pavements, you know. Um, and then for me as a pavement engineer, right, when I hear about 6PPD and 6PD quinone, that becomes a concern, right? from the you know, recycled tire rubber being used basically uh, to provide sustainable uh, pavements. And that's what we're going to try to focus over here. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues. Did I press the wrong button? No, they just put them on and wasn't on, so I don't think it matters. But now we don't have the screen. <laughs> All right. So I would like to acknowledge my uh, co-authors, right? Uh, Sri Lokesh, he's a, a, a graduate PhD student at UNR from the Environmental Engineering uh, Program. Sid, he's our research scientist, and uh, Frank and myself. And of course, Edgar Hiddy, who is uh, you know, with Grand Construction, because this work that I'm going to present today over here is 
or was funded by uh, granite construction. So I guess uh, now my background is irrelevant. After you know, Ann Cooper and Andrew, I think this is all has been covered, so I'm going to go through. The only thing I may have a better picture over here from the U.S. Tire Manufacturer Association that shows you the difference between the two tires with uh, uh, 6 PVD and without 6 PVD. Uh, I think uh, one um, aspect that Andrew hit on it is basically 6 PPD is used in the manufacture of the tires and not 6 PPD quinones. It's a transformation of the 6 PPD when exposed to the oxygen and the ozone where you get the toxic uh, product. So that being said, I just want to also, we heard this morning or earlier today about the synthetic turf and also started out of Washington. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but you know, the problem started back in 2009 and we're still dealing with it as of today, as we've heard, and we're still looking into collecting more data. So sometimes as you know, it would be good to act immediately and start looking at the issues, especially for us from a pavement perspective, right? We're using recycled tire rubbers. It's good to look at it right now and see what's the impact of what we're hearing about 6 PVD quinone on the asphalt uh, industry. So uh, I'm pretty sure everybody realized that you know, Caltrans mandate or require the use of asphalt rubbers uh, in, um, in, in paving projects. Started back in 2007 and the mandate was a minimum 20%, got bumped up to uh, uh, 25% in 2010, and then since 2013 it was a minimum of 35%. Now half of, almost half of the uh, California pr produced crumb rubber is actually used in the asphalt rubber paving. So there's a big you know, uh, amount of rubber that goes into our uh, pavements. And that's why, again, I'm going to emphasize it's very important to understand what is the fate of that 6 PVD quinone at that asphalt mixture water interface. And what we're going to talk about it is basically there are two aspects that of concern, at least, from the asphalt pavement. One is the use of the rubber into the asphalt mixtures, into the asphalt pavements. Is it leaching any 6 PVD quinone itself? And the other one, because as we saw from the water, the, the runoffs and everything that may be contaminated with 6-PVD quinone, what's happening when it gets into contact with the asphalt pavement? So that's what the phase one of the study uh, focused on as part of the study that was uh, funded by uh, Granite Construction. So again, it was literally very good timing, right? When the things came out out of the University of Washington, uh, Edgar Hiddy came, came in and said, hey, this is coming up. We start hearing noise from the public about some projects in Washington, Oregon, and California. We would like to look at it and make sure that what we're using is safe and not the other way around. And that's what kicked in the first study. And I want to also mention that when we started the study, there was no protocol that we can use for asphalt mixtures. So we spent the first several months trying to establish a protocol that we can trust, that we can basically build our knowledge on. So that was the, the first part of the study was extensively spent on coming up with the right protocol and then start evaluating rubber modified asphalt mixtures that from three different locations here or three different plants in uh, California. So what I'm going to do basically next is uh, pass it on to my colleague, Frank, who's going to talk more. He's a chemist. I'm not a chemist. I'm a civil engineer. So we, we complement each other. So he's going to take over and talk a little bit about the findings from this study. Yeah, Frank, thank you, Ili. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. OK, yeah. I'm sorry, I cannot join like in person for the meeting. So, but hopefully you can hear me clearly, and uh, and my internet will enable me to go through my presentation tonight. And as Andrew has already set up very good foundation about the analysis of six PB quinone in his talk, and here we just will show you how we have been doing this in house at University of Nevada Reno. And similarly, we have been developing this protocol by concentrating the sample at the first step because the concentration in the environmental sample is very low. And even for that toxic level, the benchmark number is like the hundred like the part per trillion. So it's even 0.1 like part per billion. So you can think about like how many zero you need to doubt there for the analysis. So basically what we have been doing is through a solid phase extraction to concentrate the sample by the factor of 1,000 to 10,000. So that can enable us to analyze the concentration using the 
HPLC or the mass spectrometry, as like Andrew has explained the term and the uh, abbreviation here. So basically, we can get down to the detection limit, enable us to detect the concentration, like the safely to beat the toxic level of this special compound. And then we, based on this, we like here, it's just like a small, like the photos of the top MS we have been using in our lab at University of Nevada, Reno. As Andrew has explained, like the principle for this analysis is basically like the ionize the compound we have been working with and make it fly in this like very precise like magnet field. Then we can measure how fast those particles fly then determining the molecular weight and the chemical species of them. So which is the foundation for our analysis and the quantification. And using this, like the a fancy toy, we can build up the covering curve as our uh, benchmark or the foundation to quantify the compound in the different samples. And here is our covering curve. And what we also want to note is we have done a, cross lab like valid validation. So the red cross we mark there is what we use the standard uh, generously donated by University of Washington, like Dr. Ed Clotty's lab. And what we can show here is that the concentration we measured like fit very well with what they like spiked, which like validate our calibration here to make us to do the next step analysis. And as like Ely just uh, elaborated, like we are uh, targeting this very unique like system for the rubberized like asphalt materials, which is very different from like most of the environmental samples uh, we as environmental engineer and chemist have deal with such as soil and sediment. These materials are very like viscous or the, yeah, you probably know more about this material than myself. But when we need to deal with that, like if we directly use organic solvent to do the extraction as a normal environmental pra practice, the compound inside it will sequestered and it will be difficult to extract out. So that's the reason we have been developing this method, which we didn't think like exists in the published literature. So basically we use a very low temperature under the liquid nitrogen, which can even cause hurt to your skin as similar as a boiled water. And under this condition, the, we can make the uh, pigment materials to be grounded to the fine powders as we show in the right part photos. So like at this stage, we can deal with them similar as the soil and sediment because they are just uh, the fine powders. And from that, we can just use the organic solvent to extract out the 6 b quinone from it. So this is a protocol we have been establishing for the analysis of this compound in this very unique system at the interface of the asphalt mixture and water. Because we are uh, like focused on their absorption and the release as Ely just elaborated, we want to understand how much of this compound is leached out from the rubberized pigment materials, and also how much of this compound can be solved on the road surface when the storm water heat the road. So to understand that, we, all, we need to like the study the absorption of this compound by the asphalt, like the packed column as we showed here. So we soak these materials into a beaker of the water, and uh, as you know, like the, this material, they have the void space inside it. So that means we need to pre-saturate them like to like the minimize the, uh, like the infiltration of the compound rather than the absorption processes. So that's what we done before we uh, like replacing the water by the uh, 6 p quinone spiked solution. And uh, from there, we can we have demonstrated uh, the absorption kinetics of the 6 bit quinone by the rubberized asphalt mixture, which is shown here as the left figure is for the crushed uh, powder, which we use them to uh, as a benchmark for the physical chemical properties of these materials inside the pigment. But we do not use that in the real world. In the real world, we see them as a pigment like compacted material, which is shown in the right figure, which we call that compacted rubberized mixture. And the y-axis is the concentration, the axis is the time. 
So basically, like so here, you can read the numbers like so going down along the time. So which means these materials, they can stop a 6 b quinone. By this, what we show here is a three different like rubberized mixture. We call them just one, two, three from the three different geo location. Like we didn't want to name the uh, like the factory there. And and the like the control, what we show on the top is like master control. So basically, without our column, the, the compound is stable within our uh, experimental period. On the bottom is our like the column control. So basically, without spike to six six quinone, the release of this compound is very negligible under this condition. So we show that under like the so within twelve days, it can reach the sorption equilibrium. Okay, and here like from there we can like further demonstrate the uh, thermodynamics for the sorption. Sorry about the a little bit like the mismatch here for the format, but. Basically, this is the sorption isosome we are using to determine how much of this compound can be solved by the rubberized asphalt mixture. And uh, on the same way, like on the left side, it's a crushed mixture. On the right side, it's a compacted rubberized mixture. And we give the number like below, which is range like the 150 to 250, like the liter per kilogram. So this number may not mean like too much to you if you are not doing the this kind of the work, but uh, to put that into the context, like the people have analyzed the sorption of other organic compounds on the concrete surface, which is similar to the pigment but still different. Their number is one order of magnitude lower than this compound. So that means like the it can be derived from uh, like the different factors, including like the we are using the pigment, like when people use the concrete. So that means the pigment may have the better like sorption capacity. And also like the, this compound is a unique compound which has a different like chemical composition compared to other compounds when they even have other similar like the physical chemical uh, parameters which can be mirrored. But the big picture message here is that our pigment surface can solve all like the, uh, the sequester this compound when it released from the storm water. Then from the other side, we also like to try to look at how much compound can be potentially released from the, the, the pigment, like the, the rubberized pigment materials. Like we have done the, uh, like the bench top experiment for the leaching, you know, which we don't have time to show here. So here we jump into the, like the storm water simulation where we fabricated the storm water like the simulator using the 3D printer. So where we can like the uh, mimic the natural like storm water to go through on the surface of our uh, like pavement column. And we also made the stainless like the uh, aperture to like as a comparison. And from here, we have done the simulation experiments with a different like the water including just the pure DI water and also the synthetic, uh, like the ring water. And we also done the different amount of the ring water going through the surface to simulate a different like the storm water condition for the, uh, like the precipitation intensity for the chemistry of the ring water. Uh, like, but what we show here is that red line on the top is where people, uh, where the LC50 was determined for this compound to coho salmon. And the uh, bottom bars are what we found from the different simulation. So the tickle message is there is some like 6 b quinone released from the rubberized pigment. And we also like the directly quantify that from the particle as we developed that protocol as we just explained. So this fraction is very like the limited uh, component is probably just less than 0.1% of the 6 b quinone in the pigment, in the rubberized pigment can be released during such like storm water event. And the concentration is well below the LC50 of this compound to the coho salmon. So that means the overall message is like this, like the materials, the pigment, the rubberized pigment materials can solve the 6 b quinone to the other side, their leaching is still like relatively minimal. So there are still lots of the open question. I think the Ely will ramp up, like also given the like opening vision from our side. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. So basically going back to the civil engineering aspect of it, the, the take, -off, take home message is basically, you know, if you have um, a rainfall, right? And you have that rainfall basically is 
contaminated with 6PD quinone. But we've observed in this study that a lot of that is going to be absorbed by the asphalt, by the rubberized asphalt mixtures and even the non-rubberized asphalt mixtures. And then only a small portion is going to be released from the mix itself back into the environment. So if we think about it from input and output, then we can consider that the rubberized asphalt mixtures are really a net sorbent. The absorption or the sorption into the mix is greater than how much it's being released. So maybe then having the rubber into the asphalt mixtures and using the asphalt mixture is really a solution uh, to the, uh, or the midterm maybe solution to the problem that we're seeing with the 6PVD quinone. Now, does that answer uh, everything? Uh, obviously uh, not. That's why we are looking into the phase two to understand you know, more, uh, you know, analyzing the 6PVD, uh, understanding also what is the fate of the 6PVD quinone, even if there's only a very small portion that what we've seen is way below the LC50, but what is the fate of that? And also, uh, Andrew talked about other maybe toxic materials that may be released and so on. So there is a lot to still do in that process, but at least the initial results from the phase one are very encouraging and seems like to be that the asphalt pavement or the asphalt mixtures are serving as as the solution for the problems and not really the problem itself. And with this, I would like you know, uh, to conclude the uh, presentation. Thank you. Joaquin's going to be next. And we're running out of time. This is what happened. We had a lot of good information, and we almost needed another 30 minutes. So there you I got go. you covered. I'm going to give I you know. one slide. Okay, good. My head is like that. I, I've just seen all this for the first time, so pardon me. Um, i got to figure this device. The green Wait, button? Yeah, green button. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so this is um, the summary of contribution of leachate from rubberized hot mix asphalt to zinc loading and roadway storm off of storm water runoff. Uh, report summary. This was done by Humboldt State University um, from 2018 to 2020 and was published in 2021. That's authored by Professor Brad Finney, Professor Eileen Cashman, and Mr. Peter Dewan. Okay, so this picture kind of tells the story. What we're looking at is stormwater runoff on our communities, goes, you know, all, all over everything, washes everything down, goes over the roads into the stormwater drain outlet before it goes into the water bodies of the state. If you were to take a sample of the water before it's going into the water bodies for zinc, then this is where this topic sits, okay? There is zinc, now where is the zinc coming from? And specifically, um, what's the contribution from rubberized hot mix asphalt? So this is kind of the table of contents of the, of the report, uh, literature review, a lot of data that comes from that is used. Uh, the top four things are different laboratory experiments or data collection and then a mass balance analysis using that data is then performed to get a picture like a snapshot, <coughs> pardon me, of, of this topic. So the, we're going to see the rubber uh, rubberized hot mix asphalt binder particle zinc contribution, precipitation event zinc contribution, tire wear particle zinc contribution, and then galvanized guardrail zinc um, estimate. So this is the punchline. I'm going to go through a whole bunch of stuff after this, but this is really, I'll end up at this slide again. Wasn't there a cute little... Okay, so really we have these elements here, precipitation, zinc from tire wear, uh, rubberized hot mix asphalt, hot mix asphalt, and all, and then um, zinc from galvanized guardrails. So we're looking at a snapshot. I'm just going to talk English here, so to speak. And the snapshot is we're looking at one spot, one section of road that has hot mix on one side, rubberized on the other. Just like the picture, we're having guardrails on both sides, and then we're looking at that snapshot at a certain place in a certain time. And it happens to be that this is the Eureka area, because we need to understand the rainfall and all those relationships. This is the Eureka area between 2018 and 2020. So this is a snapshot. And the important thing to say there is that 
That's what it is. So this isn't a broad sweep of all things. It's a snapshot. Now, if we took a snapshot somewhere else, as you'll see from the method of how we got there, it'll probably be similar in magnitude and things, but the numbers won't be exactly the same. So I just want to give you the punchline first. I'm going to go through this stuff super quick because we need time for answering questions on all these great topics. So I'm not going to read all this stuff. Basically, there's a crumb rubber leaching experiment. Uh, that's where we began to understand how zinc is coming from crumb rubber. That helps us understand how zinc is coming from tire wear particles. So we got crumb rubber from trucks, from passengers. We split it with a sieve to have a large size and a, a large size and a small size, and we ran all of those tests by soaking that in water. I forgot exactly how many days you see it there. The one thing I'll note is that uh, the analytical detection limit for all of the tests associated here is five micrograms per liter. So there may be zinc coming from stuff that we're not recognizing, but it'll be in a very small level of under the five uh, micrograms per liter. There's a picture from rubber. Large on the left, it's so greater than 0.5 millimeters. Smaller on the right, or maybe I got that backwards. Here's the results from that. The important thing to understand here is these are all those different, you'll see it there, you can read it, right? The, the passenger and the truck tires. It, it, once you start exposing it to uh, stormwater runoff, it goes towards an equilibrium over time. And that's the value that the researchers are really looking for is those, those equilibrium values because this is the rate of zinc leaving and so then you can use that with a mass balance equation and, 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 and analysis to understand how much actual zinc you're going to get over a certain amount of time. So that's the goal. And so that's when you look at this, you look for those values down in the bottom right. That's the values that are being used to go to the mass balance analysis. This is just talking about higher transfer rate for the smaller diameter particles. This is interpreting some of the data, things you would expect. The smaller the particle, the more surface area, so the larger the value of zinc uh, transfer. 240 days was that experiment. All right, so then that's one of the experiments. Then there's uh, batch testing, so there was two. First we took rubberized, or they took rubberized hot mix asphalt and hot mix asphalt and soaked them both to understand what zinc is coming from those, those two sources. And uh, the punchline is that hot mix asphalt itself isn't really releasing any substantial amount of zinc. So when we look at our picture, we look at hot mix asphalt, we would not expect to see zinc coming from hot mix asphalt. It does come from rubberized because tires are in it and tires have zinc, so a little bit is in the pavement and you're going to get that. Um, so then the second part, that was the first one, and I've kind of summarized it already, and the second one is that then they took uh, rubberized hot mix asphalt over 240 plus days, soaked it, and then got the results to understand the rate that the zinc was leaching. That's what a puck looks like, or a core. This is the first test. So on the top we have non-rubberized, and on the bottom we have rubberized. And the conclusion is that there really is no zinc coming from hot mix asphalt. So it is coming from rubberized, but not hot mix. So that was a, a you know, verification. Then they went and took the rubberized hot mix and ran that for 246 days to understand the leaching rates from that. And here's that data. This data should make some sense. Crumb rubber had really high values in the beginning and went low. And it's the same thing we're seeing here. The, the data that's trying to really be utilized is the, the equilibrium data down towards the bottom of the curve. Because that tells you you can take that data and you can use that data to develop how much mass you're going to get over time. You know, that, that's the representative data point. So that was the results of that. Now, that's the laboratory stuff that was done in the study. There was also paired field sampling, which is just like the picture, where we went and looked for locations across California where you had rubberized and you had hot mix, and hopefully the environment's very similar, and we were able to take samples from both sides and see what we saw. I'm going to go through this super quick because what you'll see is it didn't really tell much. It tells that there's a lot of zinc on the roadways, but it doesn't tell us whether it's coming from one particular source or not. So here's the locations. We use some Caltrans data to add to this. 
and then GHD uh, did some sampling, and Humboldt State did some sampling. And then when we combine all the data at the end of this, basically the setting is Eureka. The setting is the rain from there. And so just know that, that the snapshot is the Eureka snapshot. But all of this stuff was done to try to understand how to develop a mass balance analysis. <clears throat> Here is the data. I'm going to go through it real quick. The yellows are the, the, the cumulatives. And the bottom, so you see all rubberized hot mix asphalt 159, all hot mix asphalt 127. So this tells us that hot mix asphalt, if it has zinc coming off of it, that zinc is coming from other things. It's not coming from the hot mix asphalt. So there is a lot of zinc sources on the road that we're really not accounting for. I just put this all in here, but I'm going to go quick because of time. It's just what these yellow uh, summaries of these different locations show us is that at some places hot mix asphalt has more zinc on these on these road samples and sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it's the same and sometimes it's got a lot of difference so it just really says this is the Caltrans data that there was a Caltrans study that we were able to find and put that into the data pool it says the same thing they didn't find anything different than what Humboldt State found so there are other factors besides the addition of rubber to the asphalt binder that determine the resulting concentration of zinc. That's kind of the punchline. So obviously, as long as there's zinc uh, in the rubber, there's going to be zinc in the rubberized, asphalt, the rubberized hot mix asphalt. But the amount seems to be uh, a lot less than we would imagine or thinking. OK, so what happens now is <laughs> they took the data, and then they did mass balance equations for understanding the leaching the wet deposition, the leaching from tire wear particles, and the zinc loading from galvanized guardrails. So a little preface there is when you do the research before you go into the actual experiments, you look at everybody else's work and you kind of know already where is the potential zinc sources, where are they? And so that's what we have here. We chose, they chose particular uh, easily quantifiable zinc sources to get a snapshot. So that's why we have galvanized guardrails. It's pretty easy to do a mass balance and understand how much zinc is coming from the guardrails on the road. So that, there's no, no experimental data for that, but that's from the literature review. All right, so again, I'm not gonna go through all these things. The bottom line is, when we looked at zinc contribution from rubberized hot mix asphalt, we looked at the surface and the wearing where tires would wear and we got five milligrams of zinc per meter squared over a 10 year period, typical, what we assume is a typical uh, asphalt life for 20 meter, 20 meter wide road section. So that's the parameter, that's the snapshot. And it's in Eureka, because that's where we're getting the rainfall numbers because we're talking about storm water. So we've got to put all those things together to get the snapshot. That's why I said in the beginning, it's a snapshot of a particular place and time and so that's what we have to take it for what it is. That's what we can really say it is. All right, so then there was some sample data from the rain in the city of Arcata. Believe it or not, rain can have zinc in it too. And here are the, the, the results. You take that plus the rainfall allows us to develop a mass balance analysis for what is coming at that time and place from the rain of 86 milligrams of zinc per meter squared for 10 years, 20 meter wide road section. All right, so we did it for zinc, 1,200 for the guardrails. I, I mean, I should go back one. We did it for uh, tire wear particles, and here's the parameters. There's a lot of things that go into it, but you put all those things together, Caltrans numbers, you know where the location is, and you get 260 milligrams per meter squared. Then we did the guardrails. 1,200, if you use a type two, we use a Caltrans specification types of guardrails. If you use a type two, it's double that. So we look at it this conservatively. We took a type one. We put it all together. This is the punchline. Rubberized hot mix asphalt does have a little zinc, of course, because it has tire particles in it. It is 15 times less than the precipitation value of zinc, which is five times less than the pot potential from tire wear particles which is another five times less than the guardrails. So this puts a snapshot of perspective of the amount of zinc that's coming from rubberized hot mix asphalt versus other things on those roadway sections. There is the punchline again. I highlighted all the values. This is really says, says, the, says the whole thing right here. 
two guardrails, one on either side of the road. Now, when you drive, I was driving in this morning going, how many guardrails? Well, not every part of the road has guardrails, but you know what? It's, it's a substantial amount, and you might look at that now when you drive around. All of the uh, bridges have guardrails on both sides. So, and there are other sources too, but this study really just focused on the, what would be called maybe the most prominent potential sources and compared it to rubberized hot mix asphalt. Okay. Okay, do we have some questions? We have time for two questions. John Sheeran. Thanks, Sally. Uh, for, for the group, uh, th this is pretty good news. It looks like rubber modified asphalt um, won't be a contributor to either the zinc or the 6-PPD quinone issue. And my question is, have, has there been collaboration with the Water Board to get their buy-in on all this science, uh, given that you've got the Water Board and the Air Board and CalRecycle maybe somewhat in different silos to the different parts of Cal EPA except the science done by the other parts. Does anyone want to address that? Anne? I mean, I can't speak for the Water Board, but I know that they're following the issues of both 6PPD, 6PPD quinone and zinc, um, but I unfortunately can't speak to um, what they're doing otherwise. Well, I'll just say that um, we're always reaching out to the Water Board to try to share information. And we really would like to develop a stakeholder group that includes the Water Board so that decisions and, un and all the information could be shared and it could be a, you know, a California total uh, understanding. But we don't always get the response or the involvement that we would like to date. Okay, we're going to go online. Randy, we have a question. Yeah. Um, Question is for Joaquin and Dr. Yang. Uh, this comes from Kelly Moran. Thank you for the nice presentations, they say. Uh, what solution was used to mimic stormwater runoff in the experiments? Lab water and even synthetic rain lack the organics that fills, facilitate leaching of metals and organics from outdoor materials. False negative results are common. Was pavement material aged with exposure to oxygen slash ozone? So I think going back to the, what solution was used to mimic stormwater runoff in the experiments? Well, in the rainfall experiments, there was a deionized water and there is also different rainfall, synthetic water with different pHs, five and seven. And, I, and maybe Frank can uh, answer more the uh, technical part of it, but I would answer first the second part with whether it was aged not at this moment. So the first experiment did not look at the oxidized asphalt pavement yet. All of it was um, plant-produced asphalt materials. Okay, yeah, Randy, how about one more question? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Craig Manahan for uh, um, Dr. Yang. Do you have results for whether rubberized or non-rubberized asphalt absorb 6-PPDQ more effectively? We've done both. Frank, you want to answer that? We've done uh, uh, one experiment with non-rubberized asphalt. Go ahead, Frank. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have done some comparison between the rubberized and non-rubberized, which is a very interesting point. I, if I remember the number accurately, they are now different, like substantially. So we see they sub the uh, like safety quinone in a similar like degree. And back to the last question about the ring water, like we have used a different like the chemistry, synthesized like water with a different mineral there, as it was pointed the uh, chemical composition of the ring water can affect the release of 6 pp quinone. We are planning to collect the storm water from the field to simulate the storm water leaching from the pavement surface, like more, uh, like mimic the real world condition. Uh, like the ED just mentioned, like we can also simulate how the pavement materials is, is powdered in the natural condition or the application condition. Then we'll bring that back to the lab to do those simulation. But uh, yeah, as we uh, elaborated, this is just our uh, phase one study. There are still lots of the questions to answer. Thank you. 
Okay, okay, let's thank Denise and her panel. Our panel will be around. If you have any questions, thank try you. to get them during our next break.